So your accountant has said cut costs. And of course, everyone goes and looks in the marketing basket, don't they? And that's what the conversation is all about today. Which of your marketing should you be cutting? And I've got the legend on, back on the show again, Mick Brown. Excited to have you on again, mate. Thanks, Steve. G'day, everybody. I don't know why you're asking this question of the marketing manager, but hopefully I've got some good <laughs> insights into it. We're up for an interesting conversation today because I'm just about to get the whole recipe for you and then I'm going to check it on our marketing. So uh, it's going to be an interesting conversation. Yeah, well, it's one of those things where um, if you're outside of marketing and even outside of sales, you can look at marketing as uh, a complete expense with little to no ROI, especially if you're talking about branding. So when times get tough, particularly in the environment that we're in now, um, the sites get set on marketing. It's the first thing that gets cut. Um, we're here today to talk about whether you should and what you should cut. Yeah, and I've been in these meetings. You know, you go into these accounting meetings and you're all excited and then, you know, I'm not one who likes to cut costs, but of course, you know, they always bring up their conversation and it, it's like cut costs conversation of people and then the conversation of marketing is very closely followed. So that's why I just thought it'd be a really worthwhile conversation to have today for all the steel pushers out there. And in this show, we're going to give you five tangible things that you can take away from Mick Brown, who is saying, if you're selling machinery in this COVID times in Australia, he's going to give you five tangible things to take away. So I'm quite excited at that going to put it at the end of the show so you got to watch the whole show so there is a bit of a catch to it but let's crack on Mick why is marketing the first thing or possibly the second thing just after resources why does that accountant bring it up um there's I think there's a few reasons one of them is that marketing particularly branding um can be so intangible and have a, a long tail where you don't see the effects for for, for months down the track um that it's really difficult to see that for every dollar that you put in, where's the dollars that are coming back? If you consider the tip of the spear, the front line of the business, which is the sales department, obviously that's a tangible. You got five or six sales guys sitting there and they're bringing in sales, they're bringing in cash in the bank. That's a no brainer, put on more sales, more, more sales staff. When it comes to marketing, it's a lot more difficult to um, track and see what that ROI is. Um, and I think that's one of the first reasons why business owners, accountants, and people outside of, of guys like myself um, will cut marketing. Yeah, I think that's why we've got a, along pretty well over this journey that we've been together. We're able to look to the future and we're look, able to look um, a lot more long term. But I think we're able to look at some unique things that we can actually do in our marketplace and then we can track off the back of that. So we're not just doing the same of the same of the same, is it? We always like to be thinking, yes, we want to be able to track it. Yes, we want to see a return on investment. But what what does the market want? What, are, what is needed in the industry? I think it's a great place to start from. Mm -hmm. Another reason I think is that a lot of people have got been burnt. A lot of people have taken the risk. You know, a lot of people have have um, decked out the V8 supercar and spent that money and, and haven't seen the return. So you do that enough times, you spend enough money before you um, give that bad reputation to marketing. And that's why, we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, but that's why it's so important for every dollar you spend, make sure you can see how much is coming back. If you don't have those stats there, you could potentially be wasting a lot of money. So I think being burned enough times really puts that stigma on it and makes the marketing team and the marketing manager's job really hard. Rock in a hard place. Yeah, and then, you know, that does carry on and it does hurt. So when you're sitting at the table and that magic mark, you know, marketing person's asking for more money and you've just felt like you've lost money or you, you felt like it was a cost that you couldn't see a return. And then that filter, it's the old sunglasses, you know, the filter of, don't want to spend more money and it actually hurts when there's emotion attached to it. That's why the conversation gets pretty difficult, isn't it? So we've always, um, as business owners, I think we've really got to be in check of, you know, those filters and then our attitude through the back of it too. Because, you know, is the glass half full, is it half empty? 
who are we sort of hanging around? How are we looking out and seeing what's what else is good? And have we got the right attitude to carry into the next campaign we're going to do? Or to truly look at the things that are actually working in our business through the marketing? So, yeah, that's... Um, that's a little bit of advice that I've probably learned the hard way over the 14 years. Um, but I know I've got to always be in check of my attitude that then we share across the team, you know. So I've got that attitude of, yes, we can do it better the next time. Yes, we learned from it. Yes, we didn't just, you know, oh, it's a cost and we'll never do that again. It's like, what can we learn from it? What can we do better? Yeah, something's always expensive if you're not treating it like an investment, expecting a return. Um, attitude's a really big one when it comes to that, Steve. Yeah. So what marketing should they cut, Mick? What, 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 what should get cut? Um, well, I do believe that um, you should be, um, you should often reassess your marketing and you should make cuts to marketing. My rule of thumb is that if you can't measure the outcome, the ROI, clearly and often, then you should cut it. Um, even if it's the best marketing in the world, if you're just putting a dollar in and you don't know how many dollars you're getting back, there's such a big chance that you're wasting money because you can't see um, not only the failure, but also the opportunity of success as well. If you're, you're investing in marketing, you don't know how well you're doing in it, let alone whether it's working or not. Because what if you put a dollar in and you're getting $2 back? What if you could be getting $5 back? So being able to measure and track that is so critical to every single marketing channel and campaign that you do. But if you can't measure it, you've got to cut it. Yeah, and then there's another one where I think some businesses get caught just doing the same of the same or just adding to. So they might be doing 15 marketing different topics, sort of, you know, ticking along okay. But it's like, maybe they're better to do six or seven really, really well and put the right energy into it, the right resources, the right systems, true um, calculations to be able to, you know, test and measure and to refine it. So they're probably better to do six or seven really well as opposed to just 15 ordinary. And I think that's what you were good at doing in the business of coming along and going, where are we focusing that energy? Because you're so right. It's about energy and it's something that's working and we can tangibly see that it's working through measurement. Yeah, if you're not giving the full focus and attention to any of the marketing um, initiatives that you do, then you're wasting not only money, but you're also wasting time as well. Say you pick a, a marketing channel like the Machines For You Marketplace. I mean, that's a great topic for us to talk about, but if you come on board as a, a member or a customer of Machines For You, there's so many tools there that can help you um, sell more machinery. But if you just put the work in for the first four weeks and then set and forget and leave it, you're not actually utilizing that marketing investment and naturally that relationship at the end of your, um, at the end of your time with Machines For You is gonna be a bad one because you didn't believe in it, you're not putting in the effort, therefore, you're not getting um, the outcome. You reap what you sow, Steve. Exactly. As long as you're sowing it in the right area and got the right watering going on it and the right people getting held accountable, isn't it? So um, I think that's exactly why we put so much more effort into account managers. Um, our account managers work with our clients once a month. Because we used to um, you know, fall through the cracks and we hadn't ring someone for three months or four months and it's like, no, the need to proactively use it. And so much of all the marketing tools are out there like that. You've always got to be tweaking and adjusting. A um, few, few of the new guys here are very good at doing that. They just put a test in, watch it for two weeks, do it again, yeah. do it again. Because you're always refining it, isn't it? There's chances of getting something just bang on first time in this marketing world. I, I don't even know if that exists. It's like a race car, you know, one, one, one track they take it to and it's operating beautifully and then they put it in the uh, container and take it up to Darwin and the road's too hot and it's not operating. So they're just always fine tuning it. I think marketing is very similar as well. There's a potential for the environment to shift as well. And another reason um, why you should cut marketing is if your audience actually moves away from what has been working for the past 10 years. 
you take the old example of the of magazines uh, or even the most recent example of, of trade shows during COVID. Obviously your audience is no longer reading those magazines and they're online. You have to be able to identify that that's happening and be brave enough to actually shift your marketing focus over to where your audience has moved to. You should always be keeping an eye on, on where they are. Um, and it's like my old adage, fish where the fish are. If the fish have moved on, you gotta move your boat. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, don't want to bag anyone out, but the modes of communication changed over those years, didn't it? Remember right. how good the old yellow pages was sitting and working, you know, and everyone needed their 60, 80 grand, 120 grand advert in the thing. And then some people were still doing that. The audience had moved. <laughs> they were all in Google and, you know, still trade shows and print and the old uh, yellow pages were still cruising along. And then all of a sudden, people finally cottoned onto it. Some of them, because they'd just done it for 30 or 40 years, father did it before them and the grandfather did it before them so that that must work but the audience had moved so um you know here we are today where you know you, you've got to be going all right in social and you've got to be going all right in google and you've got to be going all right in these marketplaces so yeah that was um one that you know you know you needed to move the boat and get some new burley and go and anchor up at another point where the fish are as you say so um when, when should you be assessing it, Mick? How often should you be looking at your marketing? Um, the answer is always. You should always be looking um, at what's working, always be looking at what's not, and always be looking for new opportunities as well. Um, every business uh, is probably similar. Everybody sets a, a 12 month plan, financial year or calendar year. Um, they run some ideas of some campaigns or even they're fully fleshed out and then they set them for, for your 12 months. But you've got to be able to um, understand what's working and what's not and be able to adapt and never miss those opportunities as well. Because you don't know what's going to be around the, the corner from a marketing perspective or from an opportunity perspective or even a product, um, a potential product release that you could capitalize on. So while it's good to have your plan, you've always got to be assessing the numbers um, that's why having clear reporting for your ROI for every dollar you put in, make sure you know how many dollars you're getting out. Um, that's why it's so important. Um, and I check the marketing we do here at Machines for You uh, on a daily basis. We've got really great reporting tools. Um, we work really closely with the guys at HubSpot. Um, we know that when we um, do any form of marketing, we know exactly what we're getting back um, because Business is the size of ours, and I think we're probably quite similar to a lot of the steel pushers out there in terms of size and probably not revenue. We don't sell um, big machines, Steve. But Are we just um, have to do it. <laughs> talking in terms of, of resources, um, we've always got to be um, as efficient as possible when it comes to spending money, and that's not different. Every every business out there in Australia is like that. What about that number one word that? My wife reckons I don't have patience, patience. Um, you know, and I'm trying to work on that one. I know it's not one of my strong points, but in marketing, you've got to have a bit of patience, don't you? You've got to, you know, give things time to, for the water to flow and to get working, don't you? And a bit of, bit of poker, I suppose. You've got to, you've got to hold and just wait and, uh, and play your cards right. Yeah, so you've got to buy yourself the ability to be patient as well. Um, you can just be patient, but that's really hard. When I say buy yourself the ability to be patient, that means when you're making that marketing bet, because a lot of people consider marketing uh, a bet, you've got to do it off the back of good data, good numbers, so that when you're making that bet, you're reasonably sure of the outcome and you're reasonably sure of how long uh, it's going to take to start to get that return. Therefore, if you get into uh, a marketing campaign or an initiative, um, you know you're, you're in it for the long game. You know that you're there for six, nine, 12 months because you know things aren't going to start paying off for, for two, three, four months um, in advance. You've got to give it time to work. So it seems contradictory to my first point, but you should always be assessing, but be patient as well. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> out of one frog pan and into another. Uh, so. Um... Mate, time's flying by. We're already going to have to crack on to a uh, break before I get in trouble uh, from the director there. So um, let's go to a break. We'll see you after the break. 
Remember, we've got the five hot tips from Mick Brown. 2020 has been hard on us, Australia. We've battled blazing fires, raging floods, and a worldwide pandemic. But we persevere. We soldier on. In true Aussie spirit, we regroup and we rebuild. Together, we work harder, go further, and dig deeper. We see you, Australia. Putting on your boots, your high vis, and rolling up your sleeves to put roofs over our heads and food on our tables. Thank you for all you do, from us to you. Be brave and push out. Now, this is an interesting one. What do you reckon? Yeah, well, this is, um, this is a segment directly for the business owners. Um, and it's the exact opposite of the concept of cutting your marketing and cutting expenses. Um, it's right now, there are businesses all over the country who are cutting costs. Um, and they're doing so because that's the best way to, to sustain the life of the business, in their opinion. Um, in, in my opinion, if you are cutting marketing, um, you're actually sacrificing potential sales in the future. If you cut money now, you're robbing yourself of sales later. And the way the marketing works sometimes is if you are looking at those long tail campaigns, if you stop you do it, doing your marketing now, that's going to affect your sales figures and your budgets for um, three, four, five months down the track. So while you're keeping um, things going now, um, it's only going to make it harder three months down the track. But that's a tough concept for business owners and people who are holding the purse strings because it seems counterintuitive to spend more money. That's not necessarily what we're saying here, though. Um, being brave is not about just spending as much money as possible. It's about being as efficient with your marketing spend as possible, but not stopping marketing. You can't stop marketing because the sales won't happen. The get more sales department is a joint, a joint thing for a reason. Marketing serves sales, sales serves marketing. Yeah, and I think it's back to what I said earlier. You're better to do five or seven things really, really, really well, as opposed to 15 things and a bit of them and People haven't sort of bought into it in your team and they're half-heartedly doing something. I think that's a good quality question and say, what do we actually enjoy doing here that's given us a return? Because if people are enjoying it, they tend to um, do more of it, don't they? And they do it well. So there's the other part of it, you know, and uh, it's probably why, you know, we've done a little bit of sponsorship on the B8 uh, cars, Russell Ingalls' car a few years back that Lukey Bruce didn't know about. Um, but you know, it's probably why I, I like to be brave and I'm thinking, do I just want the logo on the side of the, um, you know, the Monster Energy car or one of those other ones? Or be nice to get the whole car. Because I'm thinking if they walk out after Bathurst, you know, and 20 of those drunken guys walk down the hill and, and, and hit on their way and you said to them, okay, what well, the, uh, did you see machines for you then? It was a little logo sort of going past. Maybe they missed it, but if you, if you actually held out, and then did something really well, Luke, it's coming, um, and did the whole car beautifully orange, machines for you down the side. Then we asked those 20 guys, they're like, yeah, saw the whole car, geez, he goes beautifully up the front there. <laughs> yeah, you make, you make your calculated bet. Um, as I said before, a lot of people consider marketing a bet, but if you've got your stats and your numbers and you're reasonably sure, counting cards, I suppose, if we're gonna use that um, poker analogy, if you're reasonably sure that the bet you're about to place is gonna make your money back, um, then it's easier to be brave. Um, but you've got to keep an eye on, on you know, who's holding what around the table, um, because otherwise you've just got such a potential to waste money, um, which, is, which is critical at the, at the moment. Um, nobody wants to be spending money. Definitely nobody wants to be wasting money. Of course which leads into the next little segment. Who's accountable for it, you know? And, and accountability is such a big thing in business, isn't it? You gotta have your KPIs, you gotta have your person. Sometimes I find if you've got people 
who are accountable. I always find it is nice to go to one person <laughs> coming to Mick Brown going, all right, mate, let's have a chat. You know, I, I think it's, you, you need someone who takes that ownership and that responsibility and then can lead that through the team. What's your thoughts around it? Well, I think if you've got more than one person accountable, you've got nobody accountable. Um, you've got to have somebody, it doesn't even have to be head of department. It could be just somebody who is from the outside perspective um, who might see things from a different, um, a different perspective um, that can be held accountable because that means everybody's working toward um, the common goal. And there's an important point there where at the beginning of any sort of marketing activity or any business activity, um, if those KPIs aren't, KPIs aren't set right, uh, and in marketing, if they're not set to drive the ROI that you want, um, then you're doing yourself a disservice when it comes to marketing. But further to that, if everybody sitting around the table hasn't bought in and agreed to what those KPIs are, you get to the end of uh, any sort of business initiative or marketing initiative, and the accountant over there had his KPI of cutting costs. Um, the business owner had his KPI over there of increasing profits. Um, marketing had his KPI right, but it was just his KPI. So you've got to make sure the entire business is bought into what those KPIs are and they drive the ROI, the return on investment that you're looking for. There's nothing worse than running a campaign and then you think you've kicked the goal, the guy beside you thinking you've kicked the point, you didn't even get it, you know, and the other guy's going, we haven't even got it to the end yet. So that's just ludicrous, that's set up for failure, isn't it? It's never going to be successful. It's, getting the expectations across the team, getting the buy-in. When you leave those meetings, make sure everyone agrees on it, go around the table again and go, is this the outcome we're looking for? And then give the people the chance to talk because the last thing you want is when they go down for lunch and two of them having a chat and going, oh man, you know, that's not bringing a big enough return on investment. Then you're just going to go into the blame game and no one takes the accountability, you know, and takes action and then the blame game is not a nice place to live in business, is it? So, um, yeah, that's uh, a really important part to it all, I think. Yeah, making sure that the two most important people uh, in the room are uh, on the same page when it comes to sales and marketing, and that's whoever's looking after your sales and whoever's looking after your marketing, because you've got to have that relationship so good um, and one department is happy with the other department, because that's where um, that's where some of those reasons for cutting marketing can come from. You've got tip of the spear, the most important department in the whole company, the sales guys who are writing writing checks, um, and then you've got the marketing guys who are spending money. That relationship ain't good, and marketing isn't serving sales, and sales isn't serving marketing back by telling them what they want. Um, then that's a recipe for disaster. All our sales guys are just sitting around the country right now going, okay, mate, I'm going to have a chat with you this afternoon. <laughs> mate, get ready for a few meetings. You know they always want more leads, don't they? So uh, I reckon your phone's going to be running hot. Um, so what about, uh, you know, this conversation around adapting? You know, because things move, things change. The world's a fast-paced beast at the moment, even though we've been slowed down with this coronavirus. Things have sped up, haven't they? Well, I think nobody could believe that we would go into the full lockdown that we had. And I don't think anybody expected 2020 to go the way that it had. So you've got a lot of steel pushers around the country who are booked in for trade shows that just aren't happening. A lot of steel pushers that have empty showrooms because people can't leave their homes. Everybody's shifting to online. That all happened seemingly overnight. Um, when we started working from home, it was a really quick decision for us to do. That turned on a dime. So. Being able to plan ahead, um, but always be maneuverable and adaptable when it comes to new opportunities and being open to those opportunities is so important when it comes to marketing and business in general. I think um, one of the other um, things you need to keep in mind um, when it comes to adapting, particularly in this environment, is something that I um, feel strongly with him about. You know how strongly I feel about that, and that's the very top level company goals. Um, always having your eye on the prize of what those top level company, company goals are, um, what's your value proposition, what's your vision statement, all that sort of stuff. But not be afraid to shift and adapt when you plateau out from getting toward those goals. So you might set out on a strategy, marketing campaigns, business strategy that um, works for the first three to six months 
but plateaus off towards the last half of the year, you've got to be maneuverable enough to adapt always with that finish line in mind. I think you did that really well with your fitness, Steve, when it came, I think you had a plan to get to some sort of ridiculous goal. Um, <laughs> and you got to a point where you'd plateaued out, your body had changed and you had no, no choice but to change what you were doing. Yeah, and that was the day, that was back at Christmas time, my wife put me on a three day juice thing just because I had to reach the goal, otherwise I was gonna lose my nice electric bike that I've, you know, had for the last couple of years in loves she was like you're not losing it so she got me on the old juice and it started treating but it's so true i felt like if i could do that with my body i could do it with the business too because i knew there was a few areas across the business we plateaued a bit and that's the first part is like let's go back into the truth let's go back into the stuff we're not doing as well that's okay so so many humans or people are like shy away from you know those problem points i'm like there's opportunity in there Let's go in there, um, you know, and that's what we did at the start of the year was ring out all our steel pushers out there, all the customers and just go, tell us the truth. What can we be doing better? What are we not doing so well? What are the, because they're all opportunities. And same in marketing too. It's like, if you're into the actual equation of trying to work out what's best for your customers, what's best for the market, what's best for the business, what's best for your staff, then, go back into the truth find that and then bring it out and i think that's 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 been a huge sort of step forward for us in our learning over that 14 year journey so you know i treat the company goals like your north star um you, you've always got your eye on that you always know the direction that you're going how you get there can change um how you get there you can fail you can slow down you can find opportunities and speed up but as long as you've got that North Star to guide you, then you're always going to get to that goal, um, which is what everybody in the business wants. Mick, time is flying, absolutely flying by, but we've got to get those five magic things. I said to Mick yesterday, I said to him, Radio, you are now one of the steel pushers. And um, I know you uh, knew Phil from Boss Compressors pretty well up here in Brisbane. I said, Radio, I'm Phil from Boss Compressors. What is the top five things that he should be doing right now, in your eyes, selling machinery and equipment in Australia? So here they are. What's number one, Mick? So number one, write down everything you're doing in marketing and go through and score them for ROI, return on investment. And not only score them, um, make sure that you can actually clearly identify which um, is giving you the best ROI and which of those marketing initiatives you can't track at all. Um, the ones that are giving you the best ROI and that you can track, they're the ones that you've got to keep. And if you've got to cut expenses, you can't afford not to cut the things that um, you can't actually track and measure. <clears throat> For example, if, you, if you're in the digital space and you want to track you know, the success of a marketplace or even your own website, there's tools like SEMrush out there where for every dollar you put in, you can figure out how much traffic uh, is coming back to you. And watching that needle shift um, is the best way to, to sort of keep an eye on your, your marketing KPI. So reviewing every single thing you're doing in marketing, specifically for ROI and cut what you can't measure. There you go, there's the first tip. It's a good one to kick off. What's your second one? What do you got? Make sure that um, your sales and your marketing teams love each other. They miss each other. Um, that was a concept I learned um, probably quite a few years ago now. Um, it's the age old battle. Um, and unfortunately it's still a bit of a cliche and a stigma today, but you have to make sure that the relationship between sales and marketing is not only um, pleasant and amicable, but um, one wants to work with the other and they want to serve each other as well. So marketing needs to be giving sales what sales need. Sales need to be telling marketing exactly what they need. So that when you get to the end of it, whether it works or whether it doesn't work, at least you're both on the same page during that journey. You're gonna make sure that the marketing and sales departments are basically two twins, uh, all both, both working for the common goal. I like it, I like it. And as the owner, that's music to our ears. If we're sitting up top and you've got these two teams who are one team working together and you know the leads are coming in and the conversion's happening, can refine it, can't you? When, when, when we're working out of the blame game, 
you just keep refining it and getting it better and better. All right, I like number two. What's number three, mate? What do you got? Market direct to um, your old customers, to the prospects that you've got, um, and potential new prospects with the targeted audience. So for example, the Machines for You um, database that we have, um, 130,000 or so uh, people out there that you can direct mail. Get to that audience that you know is your audience. Um, and doing it using email marketing um, is a great way to get in front of um, each of those guys and you can track it. So it's a little bit different to print and to letterbox drops and things like that. There's databases in every business. There's a database of all of your old customers. There's a database of the prospects that you've had from previous marketing initiatives that you've got. And there are new potential databases out there that you can access through any sort of marketplace or anybody that owns a database. These are the guys that you've got to tap into and marketing those campaigns and those offers directly to them uh, is a great way to generate inbound leads into your sales team. Yeah, and the amount of businesses I've gone to with our sales guys who are sitting on databases. One's over in Daphne's computer. One's in the uh, sales manager's one where he went to the trade show and got a whole heap, you know, it might be 500 prospects. They were 500 prospects who came to the stand and then they're not even working them again. So we've got to go and look at the data of the last three years and go, let's grab it all. It's in your sales guys computers because they've been sending out emails and they mightn't have got the sale, the guy mightn't have bought anything. Take out those emails out of their computers, put them all into a database, and you might surprise yourself. The amount of customers, that, you know, our steel pushers that have thought they had a database of about five or 600, ended up being about four or 5,000. And good prospects, that's the goal. They've already spent money to get in touch with these businesses in some form or other. Some of them they've already bought off them. So I think that's a, a crucial point. I like that one. What's our next one? What's number four? Number four is quite topical um, given the, the COVID world that we live in. Um, and I can see a lot of steel pushers out there and people in other industries doing it really well. And that's the virtual sales experience, the virtual showrooms, the virtual expos, the virtual trade shows. Um, video content we know is uh, massive at the moment and everybody's got a professional 4K camera in their pocket. Leveraging the, your charismatic sales team to um, demo your product, to virtually test drive or do virtual dig days or just give the features and benefits or specifications of a particular machine leveraged out to a wider audience using live streaming or YouTube or Facebook or even Instagram. Doing, giving that virtual sales experience, it's not a one-to-one -one in the showroom experience anymore, it's a one-to-many. Um, and it's a really efficient way of utilizing your sales team members' time where your showrooms might be a bit slower because we know from the traffic that we see on the Big Orange Report daily with Shavan that people are going online. Fish where the fish are, people are online, give them that virtual experience. And you can do some pretty clever and cool stuff now. You can see what we do with steel pushers from a live show when we're in the office. Um, there are steel pushers out there that could uh, easily go through their entire range of stock one by one over the next two weeks um, and market directly out to those, um, to those potential prospects and customers. To bring in new audiences and customers, hit up your LinkedIn, your Facebook and your social media as well as your existing customers and your old prospects. Um, people love video content, so it's a great way to get people um, to your show because there's not um, much of a barrier for entry to um, click onto a video on a virtual show. You're gonna you probably see a lot more audience members than you normally would if you were to hold, have an open day on a Saturday. And then the beauty of that, record it, save it, have that in your categories, because you might have an edge band today or a track today. We're doing, we're, we're demonstrating these three models, you know, and you get it out to your databases, out to these other databases that are there. They know at two o'clock on Friday afternoon, they can watch a decent demonstration from home, from your best sales guy about that tractor or about that edge bander. It's the way to do it. We've got to adapt. This is back to what you said before. I like it, but, you know. Well, you've Steve, just, just stolen number five then, Steve, because that was my number five. Oh, Video what? content that you create, whether it's live or whether you use your sales team, that lives on. 
Um, you'll record a video in January and it's still there selling that same product in December. Um, it's completely leveraged. Um, we know the world loves, <coughs> excuse me, video content. Um, it's really accessible, it's easy to watch, and it's really informative. It's the old pictures worth a thousand words, um, videos worth whatever it's worth. Um, but video content, uh, we know, improves engagement just on our marketplace. If you've got a video, it bumps it up. You would know the stats, Steve, but it bumps it up to a ridiculous level because people want to watch video content. And now if you've got showrooms that are a little bit empty and things are a little bit slow when it comes to sales, you've got the time to film that video content and upload it to your YouTube, to your Facebook, uh, or to your marketplace ads using an app like Uplist. All right, we've gone way over in time, but I wanted to get to that top five because now you've all tangibly got something you can take away, plug in your top five, let us know how you go. These are your next three months all planned out in your marketing. Hopefully the marketing manager's sitting there watching this or if you are uh, the boss, there you go. You've just been given the recipe for one of the best marketers in Australia. So thank you for today, Mick. I've enjoyed the show. All you steel pushers out there, push on through this last period before Christmas. I know some people are already starting to mention Christmas, but we've got to make it happen now. August is the time to create this content, to do it, to get it out. Make sure we have a last good four or five months before Christmas. We all go away for a bit of a break and then come back in 2021 and hopefully someone sorted out this, uh, you know, this little bug that can bugger off. All right, overhead machines for you and steel pushes. We buy better and sell faster. <laughs>